the next step uh, that's going on in earnest for the 1938 Zephyr build is blasting the metal. And there's a lot of different kinds of blasting that gets done, and I don't know a lot about it. I'm going to ask JB to uh, kind of walk me through what, uh, what happens, why they make different choices, and how they prepare the metal. And this is for the whole car, really, and uh, kind of give you guys some background on uh, how you can do a lot more than you might think. Uh, right at home in your garage or backyard or whatever, there's a lot of opportunities if you have your project going uh, to get some stuff done yourself. Um, and we'll just have JB take us along with that. Okay, JB, uh, obviously, got this car jacked up. Tell me, tell me what the methodology is, what's the thinking, I think, first of all, as far as uh, where this car is and specifically for the project. And then I'd like to ask you about all the blasting that gets done and what you can tell us about how to do it. Well, uh, firstly, the reason we, we did it this way is so that people could understand that the, the old uh, saying that it should be done on a rotisserie. A rotisserie is something that's out of the, the scope of a lot of uh, people that want to do this sort of thing at home. So we're going to eliminate that. In this case, we're going to show them how to do it without the use of a rotisserie. This car would be, re would be really difficult to do on a rotisserie anyway. As we pointed out earlier, this as the frame and the body are welded together, so it makes a much bigger object. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to even do it on a rotisserie. You could do it, but it would be uh, it would be uh, expensive and a little bit uh, dangerous. So what we're going to do is we're going to show people how they can do the accomplish the same amount of work, do the same quality work at home with things that are available to anyone. And uh, firstly, the thing only thing we really need here is a way to raise the car up. You can use a floor jack, you can lift it in stages if you want to get it up high enough where you have it at this particular attitude right here. Um, and then of course we got these jacks. Uh, these are screw jacks, they're used for uh, motorhomes. Again, it's something that you could probably make up yourself or you could just buy a couple of these. They're not terribly expensive, um, but they allow you to get the car up and be able to access the bottom of the car. In this case, we're going to be doing the floor pan on the bottom, so we need some way to get under the car that's safe. You could do the same thing. Uh, if you're concerned about that, you could use barrels full of water uh, on both ends so that the car under no circumstances could actually fall on oh, you. Oh, that's so a good the, idea. Fill the barrels with water fill, so fill they're heavy. Uh, just an old barrel, a 16-gallon or a 50-gallon barrel with water. Right. Put it under the frame such that no matter what, and of course you want to check it, you want to take the jack out from under it, the thing you elevate it with to make certain that the, it's safe and that it's going to rest on that uh, safely. That's, okay. That's job one is don't put your life in jeopardy. Right, keep it safe. Uh, no car is worth that. Uh, uh, right, right. So you got that accomplished, now you have access to the bottom of the car, you're not laying on your back, you're not eating sand, which is not very uh, flavorful, and we've also, get you know, we can stand back, we can get away from the substrate and we can get up in here and get all these little recesses. You can see here that most of this has already been done. This, this side is done. You can see what happens when you have access. You can see the, how beautifully the frame comes out. Now that'll, it puts wow. a tooth on the metal, allows yeah. the primer to bond to something that's clean and has a profile, which means that the... Uh, so this hasn't been primed or anything? This has not it just been, looks just that good. finished blasting. So it's down to white metal is the expression, which means that there's no other uh, undercoat or primer or paint or rust that's remaining and that's the way we want to get the whole thing so that when we go to prime it we it's got something to hang on to and it, it, it acts as a permanent protection we use red oxide on the bottom you can also use uh, uh, actually John Deere tractor makes uh, a product that's for this express purpose I think they call it uh, black blitz or something or other but it's a, an excellent very inexpensive i think it's only like 30 bucks a gallon you can do the whole bottom of the car uh, wow. don't go out and buy expensive uh, undercoats and that sort of thing um, that's a much better option and, and of course john deere's been been selling that product i think for around 50 years wow and um, so we use it extensively because it's a one-shot deal you don't have to mix anything you don't have to <clears throat> 
You don't have to worry about having sophisticated a spray gun or any of that sort of thing. Um, most of everything we're going to talk about is, is within access of, of the average person, uh, you know. Okay, so that's, that's where I want to go next. Right. Uh, if here I am walking up, if I was pick up a blaster, right, and I have never done it before, right, and I want I have my own project and I, I want to clean it all up like right. that, what would you tell me? What, what are the steps? Well, and, and I think it kind depends of on what points. part of the car you're, you want to do, but we okay. always start from the bottom up, okay, because we want to get that in hand. Because w once we put the car back down, we want to get rid of the nasty sandblasting and get it out of here. So we're going to strip the entire car, bottom and top, okay, and doors and fenders. Right. And everything. And then we get past that and we're done. Now, if you want to rent uh, a, a fairly large compressor, although I don't think the compressor is nearly as important as the blaster, I would get a siphon blaster. Uh, if you have an air compressor, that's great. If you don't have either one, then you can rent both of them. You get a pressure blaster, get your copper slag, and get your, uh, at least a 120 or 160 CFM compressor uh, and, and come out and do the whole car. You could actually do it in 24 hours. And return the equipment and not have to buy anything and not go to all of that trouble and be, be completely done and done it properly and quickly for a couple hundred dollars which you know is a lot less than okay what a professional so you're telling me for the the equipment itself it's not that unreachable at all not at all not as you not as long as you know what to get you know uh the type of equipment I'm, again it's a, either a 120 or a 160 cfm compressor and a uh -huh. pressure pot uh, you can in, in any large cities you can usually rent that, but you can also use a siphon blaster with a bigger compressor. Okay. Okay, it's a little less a little less efficient, but uh, it'll still do the job. Now, what about technique? Can I ruin anything doing it myself? Yeah, I think we're gonna walk right over here and we'll sure. show you something. Yeah. Now, now, chassis is pretty much bulletproof. It's because it's made out of thicker metal. Right. Uh, curved surfaces tend to be stable. Flat surfaces are really vulnerable to sandblasting because. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're heating up one side of the metal and the other side stays cold. And anybody who works with oh. torches knows that when you heat on one side, cool on the other, you're going to cause warpage. That's where it warps, right. And it, it does create a huge amount of heat. Um, so when we're, when we're sandblasting, we want to make certain that the nozzle is, is, a, is skipping off the surface. You never turn it 90 degrees to the surface, okay? Oh, okay. You could bore a hole right through this with a, with a sandblaster very quickly. Yeah, but more likely what will happen is you'll get it hot on the on the side that's being blasted it's cold on the back and what happens is the thing is just going to it's going to wave and 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 warp very quickly because what you've done is you've expanded the molecules on one side and on the other side you're not um, when you're doing body work you're always when when you have a dip in a, in a fender you, you support the back and you you want to push it back out but what you're doing is you're shrinking the metal back to the original position it came when it was made on the press I so see, I we want, see. when we blast this again, we want we want to be sk uh, skipping over it like this. We never turn the blaster right to it. Okay. Okay. Now on the edges you can because it's much stiffer. But when you get out in the middle, especially out in this vulnerable area right in here, you you definitely want to be going on a skipping motion so okay. that you're not and, and moving the blaster quickly and back and forth, back and forth. Do not concentrate on one little area. So you keep it moving. Keep it moving. Keep it at um, an angle. And, and you can see the, how beautifully this fender's come out. Right. But we haven't done anything to warp it. It may have some, some imperfections of, you know, living in the real world. But right. uh, here's one area, for instance, where I think the factory you know, is pinched together and they just welded it. There was a lot of leading back in those days okay. uh, if you had a real difficult stamping. You just ran into uh, an area where it could, wouldn't come out of the mold in, unless they made a, a crack here. So they would they would mm. lap it and and weld it and then and, 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 and let it in and then and then weld it. I've actually seen them uh, do it at Buick um, several years ago. It was fascinating to watch. Huh. Um, okay. But they can do it very quickly and be, do a really good job. Yeah. Um, so these flat areas, of course, are not nearly as sensitive. And of course, if they they get a little bit too much blasting, it's not that critical because you know, you can straighten those with a hammer and a dolly. This this round right here is very, very sensitive to overheating on the surface by virtue of a sandblaster. Now, a siphon blaster is pretty hard to create that kind of heat, but with a pressure blaster, it's it's very easy and very, very common for people to get too aggressive and turn the sandblaster either too close or directly at a 90 degree angle. And what they're doing is they're warping the metal on the yeah. outside 
The other side, of course, is, is different, so it creates a wave. Okay, now what about the choice of the material you're using to blast it with? Well, there's a lot and of different... How many options are there? We have, we have about five. And uh, as a practical matter, the one that I like the most, as you can tell, is, is copper slag. It's inexpensive, uh, it's safe, it doesn't put off any kind of a, a smoke or, or any kind of a pulverized material that's going to get in your lungs or get in your skin. Um, right. Silica is, is really, really bad for that. Uh, copper slag is so hard that it really does not necessarily you know, uh, self-destruct on impact. So it, you can actually use it two or three times before it lo loses its efficacy. Okay. You just take it and put it through a filter to get the junk out of it. Mm -hmm. And you can reblast it, so you can use copper slag two or three times. Okay. Um, it may not be commonly available. Uh, there, are, uh, the the other alternative is uh, uh, what they do is they pulverize windshields okay. and they turn it into a blasting media, which, believe it or not, because of its nature and its the way it's made, is actually safe. Um, and that's what a lot of professional blasters use hmm. is they use pulverized uh, windshield blast. Okay. It's also inexpensive, relatively, um, and, and safe. Okay. Beyond that, you got walnut shells. I, uh, I don't care for walnut shells for a simple reason. They just don't w work that well. Uh, they're softer, so they don't, they don't bite as hard. And if you're trying to do something quickly, uh, walnut shells are okay because, of course, they don't create any kind of a, a, a problem in terms of safety. You can do it out in the parking lot uh, in front of an EPA inspector, and there's not, no, nothing going on wrong there, but it's very slow, and, and it doesn't bite very hard, so it takes a lot longer. But it's okay you. for small, sensitive areas like a dash or something where you'd want to come in, especially yeah, on something delicate like this. Up yeah, in there. very delicate. We don't want to get in here with something really aggressive, so we'll probably drop back to something like wallet, walnut shells, even um, baking soda or crystalline baking soda. Okay. Now the problem with crystalline baking soda, and a lot of people didn't realize this until it was too late, is that crystalline baking soda impregnates itself into the metal. Uh, Let me just stop and. Re and repeat that. It, re it goes into the metal and does not come back unless you remove it. So you got to be very careful that you wash it very carefully after the fact because a, a number of cars got soda blasted, primed and painted, and six months later the paint all came off because oh. that soda had impregnated itself into the metal and precluded the, the primer from actually getting a bite on the metal. Gotcha. So okay. you got to be very careful to wash it, wash it, wash it, and scrape it you know, and get, get the, the re residual baking soda out of it. Otherwise, it's a great material. Okay, now, your particular nozzle set up there, can we have a quick look at that? Yeah, um, that this, is a, this is a pleasure blaster. This is an old fashioned uh, unit that we've had probably 20 years, and uh, you don't need a, a huge reservoir. Some of these reservoirs are enormous. I have no idea why you need a 16 bag reservoir, but um, right. this one will hold about a bag and a half. Okay. You just keep feeding it. Uh, we, we put things through uh, filters to get the junk out of it. And so we it's as simple as the, just basically the compressed air is yeah, coming exactly. in. Yeah, exactly. Now valve. we've got a, a large compressor yeah. feeding it. Uh, you could use a smaller compressor that would build up pressure in a tank yeah. and it would work for a while and it, you could get by with that. Uh, right. You could also use a, a siphon blaster, which doesn't require nearly as much air, but it also is not nearly as fast either. Okay. So it's kind of a balancing act. Yeah, um, but it seems like a pretty straightforward uh, for piece For most of people, a, a siphon blaster is plenty good enough. Yeah. If okay. you just want to do a door at a time, there's no point to having a pressure blaster and a lot of CFM. Right. Okay. You're going to do the door in two minutes right. instead of six minutes. I mean, what's what possible difference in All right. does that make really in the real world? Cool. So know? for a newbie, does anything else uh, pop out as you, something out to you? Or yeah, I think the, uh, the first thing to do is get some so equipment, we are really big on having a full body containment so that we're not exposed in any way. They sell inexpensive shields now with plastic covers that are removable and replaceable. And yeah. all that stuff is now very, very reasonable and accessible on, online. Whereas before, when we started in the early days, of course, none of that was out there. Right. So it was very So expensive. it's basically a fully enclosed yeah, body suit, basically? Yeah, you want to be fully basically. enclosed because you don't want to be subject to even uh, copper slag is, is is uh, flying all over the place and uh, you just don't want to be concentrating on that and and worried about ingesting something or getting it in your skin it's just irritating it's not going to hurt you in any long-term way but it's the, for the operator's sake 
it's just a lot better for him to have something uh, that protects his skin, his eyes, his, his head. And they sell inexpensive head socks and, and removable shields that you can use for your eyes. Yeah. And then wear a dust mask underneath it. And you can tape the, tape the mask to the top of a, a throwaway uh, uh, suit that you can buy for three or four dollars at a hardware store. Uh, for painting, for instance, there's yeah. one that's you know a white suit yeah. that is uh, will cover your entire body, and then you don't you're not subject to any kind of uh, irritation or problems with the, the medium that you're using the blast. Great, that's a very good, very good hits. Thank right. you so much. Okay.